and he could draw you every nook and cranny within 10 mile radius of right. where he disappeared. He did not disappear. So the implication was that, oh, you know, maybe some marijuana growers got him or something. But everything within 15 miles was combed and there were no gardens found. There was nothing found where they searched high and low everywhere and they, they can't find him. You know, they interviewed his son and he was just completely heartbroken that he couldn't help find his dad. His brother couldn't find his dad. But the weird thing was in this instance is that this is probably a one percenter, whereas one percent of the time in any instance, two people disappear. If they could find Trevor because they were combing so efficiently, they should have been able to find Sean. And because they went back in the summer with cadaver dogs, they still couldn't find a body. Big Buck Registry's Deer Hunting Podcast, episode number 223. Dave Pilates, Missing Hunters 411, The Stranger Things. Please support our sponsors as they make this show possible. Today's show is sponsored by Black Ash Outdoor Products. Reduce your risk of tree stand suspension trauma with a tree stand wingman, the tree stand emergency descender system. The Enforcer, take control of your odor footprint with your personal ozone generator. The Rack Packer, don't drag your deer out of the woods like a caveman. Never drag a deer again. No need to kill yourself dragging a deer when there's the Rack Packer. Go to therackpacker.com. Covert Scouting Cameras, remote cameras for hunting, wildlife, and security. The Horny Buck Seed Company, it's all about the freshest seed. Morse's Sporting Goods, a full line of sporting goods without the sales tax. Northwood's Common Sense, New England's finest white-tailed deer lures, 100% fresh, pure, and undiluted. And Big Buck Merch, for only $19.99, you can get a cool, high-quality Big Buck t-shirt and show support for this podcast by visiting www.bigbuckregistry.com forward slash M-E-R-C-H. Big Buck Registry is a virtual museum of hunting stories. We preserve a piece of Americana by interviewing and recording hunters about their hunts and experiences from across the country. And who knows, maybe we'll learn a thing or two along the way that'll help us take our hunt to the next level. Hi, this is Ben Rising with Whitetail Edge. Sit tight because you're about to listen to the best podcast you possibly can listen to, the Big Buck Registry Deer Hunting Podcast. Hello, this is Cuz Strickland with Mossy Oak, and you're about to listen to the podcast that I listen to 16 and a half hours nonstop. The Big Bug Registry is the best out there. Hi, my name is Joe Donito. I'm one of the Adirondack Trackers at adktrackers.com, and you're about to listen to my favorite podcast, Big Buck Registry. Hello, ladies and gentlemen and fellow predators. My name is Jay, and thank you for tuning in to the Big Buck Registry's Deer Hunting Podcast. For Dusty Phillips and Jim Keller and the entire staff here at the Big Buck Registry, welcome to this week's show. There are a couple things I'd like you to do for us if you could. If you would, please check us out on iTunes, subscribe, and leave us a review. With your help, we're going to try and push this show up the iTunes charts. I know we have a lot of listeners out there, and I need you to take some action. I need you to leave a review and subscribe to the show. If you do subscribe, that'll give you access and notification each and every week that a new show is released. You can also access this show in its entirety on YouTube, Stitcher, TuneIn Radio, iHeartRadio, and Google Play. It's all right there for you to access on demand at your fingertips. Regarding the harness program, we have an ample supply of harnesses to give away from our volunteer donors. If you're in need of a full-body harness, please send an email to j at bigbuckregistry.com. You are about to listen to a series of stories where the victims never thought they'd be lost. The vast majority of these stories have never been documented before at this level. Dave Pilates, author of the book Missing 411, Hunters, Unexplained Disappearances, part of a series backed by the Can-Am Project, decided to delve deeper and investigate a subset of missing persons, specifically those who disappeared in national parks and forests. Dave identified a deeper subset of missing persons that hit home with us, specifically hunters with skill sets whom you'd never imagine deemed missing, much less lost, many of whom were never found. Dave explains how he first came across this unusual subset of missing victims, shares with us five of the many stories in his book, and attempts to put some perspective on what each of these cases 
have in common. We'll turn to our interview with Dave Pilates in just a moment, but before we do, let's turn to Jim Keller with the Deer News. For the Big Buck Registry, this is Jim Keller with the Deer News. Our first story this week, proposed New York state laws would make it easier for towns to run deer kills. This story is from the New York Upstate website and was reported by Elizabeth Doran. The New York State Department of Environmental Conservation released a memo earlier this year restricting communities' culling efforts. That memo said these practices were not allowed. Use of bait within 300 feet of a public highway, possession of a loaded firearm in a vehicle, discharge of firearms at distances less than 500 feet from a building, discharge of a firearm from a road, use of long rifles on Long Island and in Westchester County. These restrictions make it hard for communities like Syracuse to cull deer because they can only use sharpshooters in open areas that aren't near the road or other homes. One bill introduced about a month ago would help communities such as Syracuse, villages of Fayetteville, and the town of DeWitt to cull deer to reduce the overpopulation. If passed, the legislation would remove these restrictions and allow the DEC to issue permits as they have in the past. Another bill which has passed both the State Assembly and Senate is awaiting the governor's signature to become law. That bill would require the DEC to summarize the deer management techniques that work, explaining who is doing what and basically provide a foundation for municipalities or neighborhoods that want to adopt a deer management plan. This bill would help neighborhoods to plan better by using the most effective techniques to manage their deer population. A third bill would include ticks and mosquitoes as an invasive species as they spread tick-borne illnesses. This bill would help to address some of the issues in New York with the increased spreading of Lyme disease. Disease kills hundreds of deer before hunting season starts. This story is from the Fox News website. Deer in East Tennessee are being ravaged by a virus weeks before firearm hunting season opens. The recent outbreak of epizootic hemorrhagic disease, which is transmitted by small flies, is concerning hunters in Tennessee because of the damage it is doing to the white-tailed deer population. The disease, which is spread through biting midges and other tiny biting insects, is common for deer to get, says Mimi Burns, the Tennessee Wildlife Resource Agency Information and Education Officer. What isn't common is the number of deer the virus has killed this year, the highest number since 2007. At the beginning of October, the Wildlife Agency received 158 deer reported deaths in Morgan County alone. The disease does have an expiration date, though, the first frost of the season. The midges, or no as they are commonly called, cannot survive cold temperatures. Though unfortunate for hunters, Barnes says the outbreak is no cause for alarm and should not lead to huge negative impacts on deer herds. Did you know? This story is from the National Deer Alliance website. As hunters, we know we are the leaders in conservation efforts for deer, as well as other big game species around the world. We all enjoy being successful, and many of us may even bring a sort of competitiveness to hunting, even if it's all in good fun. One more truck in the parking lot to our public lands, or one more deer stand in the woods, may seem like a detriment to your own success. The truth, though, is that we're all on the same team. It takes a collective, informed, and passionate conservationist to achieve the overall success we want as individuals. The reality of our current situation is our team is getting smaller and less engaged. Did you know that we have lost 2.2 million hunters from 2011 to 2016? This decline resulted in almost an $11 billion loss in hunting expenditures over that time frame, and a percentage of those dollars came right out of the government checkbook that pays for conservation efforts via the Pittman-Robertson Act. This is an important issue that all of us hunters should understand going forward. To see all of the results from the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service's 2016 National Survey of Fishing, Hunting, and Wildlife Associated Recreation, please visit wsfrprograms.fws.gov website and follow the links to the survey. That concludes this week's edition of the Big Buck Registry's Deer News. For links to the stories featured this week, please check our show notes at www.bigbuckregistry.com. If you have any ideas for future topics or have any questions about any of these topics, please email me at jim at bigbuckregistry.com. For the Big Buck Registry, this is Jim Keller with the Deer News. Well, thanks to Jim Keller with the Deer News. Without further ado, here is Dave Pilates. Dave Pilates, welcome to the Big Buck Registry's Deer Hunting Podcast. How are you, my friend? Great. Thanks for having me, Jay. I am 
very excited to talk to you. We, uh, I'm a podcast fan, as you can probably tell, and I listen to a lot of missing person cases and cold cases that I guess the rest of the world's listening to, but I always I find them fascinating. My wife finds them fascinating, and this is this is your genre. So I can't believe I've got somebody that actually investigates this stuff right on my ears right now. This is this is exciting for me. Well, I hope I don't let you down. <laughs> you won't. You won't. Dave, tell us about yourself. Where are you from? So, I uh, grew up in the San Francisco Bay Area, went to Berkeley, transferred to USF, ended up getting a couple degrees, and I went to work for the San Jose Police. Okay. I spent 20 years in police work in the Bay Area, retired, had a master's degree in human resources, so I worked in technology for the next several years in HR, ran a couple of HR groups for large technology companies, retired a second time, and uh, I still had that investigative urge. and. I was investigating some topics at a national park, and I saw a couple people following me around that were rangers, and I didn't think much of it at the time, but uh, that night I got a knock on my door, and uh, these guys knew me because they'd, I guess, read some articles I'd written in the past, and they came in and talked to me, and they said, hey, that they had worked at several national parks in the past, and before they knew each other, they both came to the realization that there were many different types of missing persons cases that they had worked hmm. and it had bothered them because on the front end that first seven to ten days there was a lot of publicity there was a lot of effort to find the person and then after that there was just like someone jumping off a cliff there was nothing there was no follow-up there was no reports there was no publicity there was no nothing hmm. but when they got together at this park and they started to talk they realized that these people are not disappearing so much in the way, way back country as in places maybe they shouldn't be disappearing on normal trails and places that would, would be maybe hard to get lost on. And uh, when they tried to retrieve information from the National Park Service themselves, they found some obstruction and they didn't think anybody cared and somebody should look into it. So independently, they gave me this information. They were both good people. And the next day I left, called some law enforcement folks, and I said, hey, is there anything to this? Are there, a, you know, a number of missing people at national parks? Several hours later, I get a call back, and they said, holy cow, yeah, there are. But uh, there's not a lot of information on it, and it's hard to tell what's going on. Huh. And that kind of started it all. Uh, that first month, I knew that the National Park Service had a large contingent of National Park police officers that were federally trained at the Law Enforcement Training Center. They were really a good agency, had a lot of people, had a lot of resources, so I, I immediately filed a Freedom of Information Act request against the Park Service for a list of missing people inside their jurisdiction. Right. And within a month, I get a call from one of the attorneys, which is very strange. Okay. Because you, usually you just get a denial letter or you get what you're asking for. But I get a call from an attorney asking me why I wanted the information. Hmm. And according, according to the Freedom of Information Act, you can't ask that and use that as a determining factor on if you distribute the information. We had this kind of back and forth, and I said, you know, you can't ask that. And he goes, oh, no, we're not going to use that to determine if we're going to charge you or if we're going to give you the information. I, I just want to know. Huh. I said, I'm just using it for research. And uh, he said, well, uh, we don't have any lists of missing people in our jurisdiction. What? I said, wait a minute. <laughs> you have hundreds and hundreds of police officers in each national park and monument, and your federally trained law enforcement group. And you don't keep track of missing people inside of your organization. Nope, we don't have any lists. And I said, okay. I said, how about if I request you to put together the information because I'm a published author, then you get the information and give it to me. And that's part of the Freedom of Information Act. Right. He goes, I'll get back to you. <laughs> Six weeks later, he calls me back and he says, my books aren't in enough libraries to qualify. Well, Jay, there's no such qualification. It says if you're a published author, then the government agency has to supply the information. Right. So now it's pretty obvious that they don't want to give up the information. And uh, I went to a really, really good friend of mine, a guy named George Knapp, who's the head investigative journalist for CBS Las Vegas. Okay. Won two Peabody Awards. He's big time. And I, I laid out to George what's going on. He goes, Dave, they're, they're lying. Hmm. They've got the information. They're just lying to you. I said, okay, well... Maybe I'll go back one more time. One more time I make a pass. I said, okay, uh, here's what I do. I'm interested in paying for the information. So you accumulate it. You give it to me. I'll pay for it. I right. want a list from Yosemite to begin with and then from all jurisdictions inside the Park Service. He goes, I'll get back to you with a quote. So for Yosemite, they wanted $34,000 for that list. 
And for the entire system, they wanted $1.4 million. For something that should be free? Wow. Jay, I could march you into any medium-sized police department in the United States, and that chief of police would have a list of all the missing person in his jurisdiction in a matter of hours. Right. Absolutely, they would. So I got that information, and so uh, then I went on to the U.S. Forest Service and did, got the same exact response. No list of missing people. Even though they have law enforcement officers assigned to the U.S. Forest Service that patrol their jurisdictions, and they have a law enforcement division, they said they don't have any lists. <laughs> I, I'm, uh, I'm I'm dumbfounded by by the bouncing ball here. Well, I, I think that uh, myself and all the investigators that I work with were, excuse the expression, a little pissed. Yeah, because we we knew we were getting lied to, we knew we were getting the runaround, and we knew that there were a lot of people missing. So at this point, uh, just put nose to the grindstone and put feet on on soil and started just hard tracking it and going into archives and pulling cases and finding out what is happening at these places. And initially, when you look at 100 missing persons cases, eh, maybe not a lot is going to fall out of there as unusual or is going to stand out that is consistent. Mm -hmm. But when you look at 1,000, certain indicators, we call them profile points, start to fall out as unusual. And there's a clustering effect of these missing people in North America. Okay. And after seven years of doing this and looking at over 5,000 cases, personally, I've written six books about this. And they all start with missing 411. There's missing 411 Western U.S., Eastern U.S., North America, and beyond. Mm. There's one called Devils in the Detail, another one called Sobering Coincidence, and this last one called Hunters. Mm. But I've written about 1,600 disappearances, and they all fit this narrow profile that we've established on missing people in rural areas. Could be a U.S. national forest, could be a national park, could be uh, BLM land. As long as it's open space, we'll look at it. Okay. Now, what we found is the number one point in every, almost 99.9% of the cases is that when they bring canines to the scene to look for the missing person, mm-hmm. the canines either can't find a scent, won't track, or sometimes we'll just walk in a circle and sit down next to the handler. Not something that is real, normal behavior for a canine. Right. I worked on a SWAT team for several years, and we had the city's uh, canine team attached to us with 40 dogs. Yeah. Those dogs just love to hunt. And for a dog do. to do that right. is really strange. So so why why would they do that? Is, is there an explanation, or is it just something that still undetermined? I've heard everything under the sun. I've heard, well, there must not be a scent trail there. Or the dog's picking up something that doesn't make them comfortable or, you know, there's, there's a lot of things that I've heard. I've never heard anything that's cogent that applies to every situation, but that is one of the relevant points. Okay. Another one is that weather changes either just as the person is disappearing or immediately after it's reported to law enforcement. And weather changes can be anything from fog, rain, snow, heavy wind, anything that affects the search themselves. After looking at uh, thousands of cases, there's 59 clusters of these missing people in North America. And the one location in the U.S. that has the biggest cluster of disappearances is Yosemite National Park. Okay. Another profile point is that if the victims are found, they're often found in an area that had been previously searched, not searched once or twice, sometimes 50 times. And then magically they appear in this area, and most instances they're deceased. Many times when a coroner does an autopsy on these people, they can't determine a cause of death, which is not normal. If the victims are found, many times they're missing shoes or clothing, even though the area wasn't real cold, there shouldn't have been hypothermic circumstances, but they're missing these items. Normal time of the disappearance is in the late afternoon. Okay. Many of the victims have a disability or some kind of illness. And this is this is a strange point, but you get into this when you talk to the families and they said, oh yeah, he was a diabetic or oh yeah, he had a bad knee or something along those lines. And then uh, most commonly is that uh, the person was alone when they disappeared. This is about 99% of the time. Fascinating. So these are all the, these are all the points that you're, you're drawing from these cases and their consistencies. Yes. Okay. There's only been one case where we know of where a person was carrying a personal locator beacon. This is something I try to hit home every time I talk at a conference, and especially to hunters, Hmm. outdoorsmen. Many people don't even know about this. 
but every hunter out there should be carrying a personal locator beacon. They cost between two and three hundred dollars. You carry it on yourself. If you go missing, you activate it. It sends a message up to a satellite. Satellite sends it to the National Oceanographic and Atmospheric Administration. They look at the location, they call search and rescue, and they respond within 10 feet of where that transponder went off. And I would say that probably at least 90% of the people I wrote about would be alive today if people were carrying those. Wow. This is intriguing, to say the least. So what's happening to these people? Well, I, I think that you need to understand the dynamics of it before you can start saying what's happening. Okay. I mean, the only thing absolutely I can say is that these people disappeared in areas that they had sometimes hunted for 50 years. And they bring in search and rescue, and they can't find a clue. They don't find a rifle. They don't find a backpack. They don't find people. Sometimes when people disappear, they start shedding things, and then they find that, and that'll lead to the person. Hmm. That isn't the case in these instances. Um, in this book, uh, there's 148 cases I wrote about, and there were 140 men that were involved in eight women. Okay. Involved 26 states, nine territories in Canada, and then also cases in Australia and one case in Azerbaijan that uh, is really, really strange. I won't talk about it tonight, but it was it was strange that we included it. Okay. Yeah, that's that's quite a ways from from home. Yeah, but I think if as a researcher or investigator, if you're not keeping an open mind and say, "Oh, I'm only going to look at North America," then you're short sighted because these type of things are happening all over the world. Now, I, you know, every day I get at least two or three cases that come across my desk from somewhere. Okay. And we use these exclusionary policies to say, hey, we won't work this case. The number one exclusionary term is animal predation. If there's any evidence of animal predation, animal attack involved in the disappearance, we won't work it. Gotcha. How any type? Well, because it's pretty obvious then what happened. Okay. Um, also, voluntary disappearance, suicide, somebody just wants to fall out of society, yeah. won't work that. Any type of mental health issues, we won't work it. Uh, if it's a water-related drowning case, we, 90% of the time we won't look at it. And then also, so if there's any type of criminal allegation in regards to the disappearance, we won't look at it. We only look at, uh, again, missing persons cases that are classified as missing person by law enforcement and that carry those profile points we established. Okay, so the exclusionary profile points that you're talking about, these are the ones that it appears that it's obvious as to what probably happened. Yeah. Okay, so it's the ones that don't have an answer that you start to pursue. And a lot of times I get people at conferences and things that'll say, well, you know, it's obvious that the this was an animal attack. Well, no, because if there was an animal attack in any of these cases, then the law enforcement officials and search and rescue and the canines would have figured that out at the front end because there's certain things with predation that happen. You know, usually there's an attack scene, there's a lot of hair, blood, drag marks, clothing, et cetera, that's found. Even if you don't find the body and the body's cached, you'll find it. Okay. Or you'll find evidence of that struggle. Okay. And in these cases that I write about, there's none of that. Gotcha. Okay. So this particular book that you wrote about, they are all hunters. And this is this is where it captures our attention, our our, our fan base here. So again, when you look at these 5,000 cases, you have kids that disappear at two years old, and you have older men and women that disappear at 80 years old. And in those groups, there's certain things that are starting to fall out. And one of the subgroups of these missing people that became obvious was is there was a large group of hunters hmm. that disappeared. That's and to some people, yeah, and to some people out there, they think, well, that's kind of an unusual subgroup because these guys or ladies are armed. Mm -hmm. Many times they know the area they're hunting intimately. Many times it's their own property or a friend's sure. property that they've hunted for decades. Sure. And when you go back to the relatives and you talk to them and say, no, that, this would have been the last place on earth anybody would have expected it, them to disappear. And that right. is really, really a very common response. That's interesting because, I mean, I, I feel that there are certain spots, well, I hunt various areas. Some spots are brand new to me, well scoped out, but there are other places where I feel like I don't even need a map because I've been there so many times and I can get home. But you're saying these are the types of places where people are disappearing and, and hunters to boot who have strong, most likely strong navigational skills and, as you said, a firearm or a weapon. Correct. And I, I think 
that there's a large percentage of your audience right now that's thinking, well, these are people probably don't hunt a lot and, you know, maybe aren't really outdoorsmen and, you know, they're just in the wrong element. And this first story I'll tell you about is the polar opposite of that. And there are many, many of the outdoorsmen I've written about that are the polar opposite of that, but are the most experienced, the most conscientious, uh, the I mean, there are people that you would have on your show. Those are the kind of people they are. Right. Okay. So it's not easily dismissed. The the first case uh, happened uh, September 14th, 2004 in the Yukon Territory in the Reed Lakes area. Okay. And it involved a guy named Bart Schleier. He was 49 years old. Now, Bart was your absolute ultimate outdoorsman. He was born in Cheyenne, Wyoming. His dad was a physician. And together, he and Bart traveled the world hunting. And his dad emphasized that the hunt was 95% of it and not the kill. And how you had to be stealthy in your environment and how you had to respect the the mammals and things that that were there. And I mean, it was a really, really important thing to his family that you respected the outdoors. Hmm. Well, Bart went on, graduated from Montana State University with a master's in wildlife biology. And he wrote his thesis on Yellowstone bear activity and how the bears react to humans. Okay. And, and right away, he was noticed because he had insight and knowledge that most people with 20 years in the field didn't have. And he was immediately hired by a grizzly bear study unit at, Mon- at Montana State that was working in an interagency program in Montana and Wyoming on bears. Then he went on to work for the Montana Fish and Game in the Bob Marshall Wilderness, trapping grizzly, placing collars on them, and studying them, studying the behavior. Hmm. And uh, in my research on this, there were a large amount of people that believed that Bart knew more about bears than anywhere in the world when it involved behavior, tracking, and luring them into an area. Okay. He was an exercise fanatic. He, uh, he would sometimes come back after it. 10 mile hike into the woods and start lifting logs that he had made for exercise. <laughs> and then in uh, late 1990s, he was invited to uh, Eastern Russia to study Siberian tigers. And then in 2002, he moved back and he went to the Yukon and he enjoyed the Yukon because it was pretty much a wild area and there was great hunting and he was into bow hunting. And mm-hmm. on September 14, 2004, he contracted a float plane to fly him into a place called Reed Lakes. It's about 110 miles east of the Alaska border. Okay. Now, Bart took supplies in a raft. He was dropped off by the pilot. The pilot knew a date to come back. Mm-hmm. Now, I have been to the, I've personally been to the Yukon, I think, six or seven times, and I know this area he went into. And I knew a bunch of government people, and they put me in, in touch with the chief wildlife officer, the natural resource officer for the Yukon that investigated this case. So keep it in the back of the mind that what you're hearing from me is absolute fact. Right. Well, the, well, the plane was supposed to pick up BART on uh, September 28th, four days after he was dropped off. The pilot went in to, a, to the camp, started looking around, calling BART's name. Well, he saw that BART's tent had been knocked down. He found some bear spray sitting on a table, found his VHF radio and other supplies, food supplies sitting there. Yelled for BART, couldn't get a response. He, he said he felt creepy. He left and he called RCMP. Hmm. Well, if you're ever up there in northern Canada and you expect the RCMP to help, do not count on it. Okay. The RCMP did a flyover of the area and that's it. Well, yeah. his friends heard this and got upset. They hired the same pilot, flew him into the camp, and six of them went in there. And they looked around. They couldn't find the boat, the uh, float boat that was dropped in. Mm-hmm. So they go across the other side of the lake and 60 feet inland, they find the boat and they found a supply bag of Bart's that was full of gear. And they found his bows and arrows that were leaning on that same bag next to a tree. And it appeared to be from people there that Bart had leaned the bag up against the tree, sat on the bag, leaned up his bows and was probably trying to call in a moose. This was the theory. Okay. A short distance from the bag, they found the face mask with a real small amount of blood on it. And they got on the radio and they called the RCMP back to the scene. And nobody still really knew what, what was going on. So on the 3rd of October, the RCMP and state conservation officers responded. And they set up a grid pattern in that area on the other side of the lake. And 60 yards from the bow, they found a human skull with a few teeth. Hmm. And they found his camel pants intact and small bones nearby. 
The teeth were positively ID'd as Bart's, okay. and the RCMP immediately claimed that he was killed by a grizzly. But the wildlife people at the scene that really know the outdoors said it doesn't seem like that. It seems odd, but they don't think a grizzly bear killed him because the pants he was wearing were completely intact as though they were taken off. And there was other indications there. There was a lot of bear scat, but they took the bear scat and they were going to have it tested to see if there was any clothing or human remains in it. Yeah. So the returns were there was no, no clothing in the scat, no human remains in the scat. And most of the clothing that Bart would have been wearing was never found. Hmm. There was no signs of a struggle. There was no drag marks. There was no big predation scene per se. Right. And his cap and his baklava was found undamaged with no blood on it. Well, the coroners confirmed that the skull did have bite marks and puncture marks on it, but not from a bear, and the coroner didn't know what it was from. Hmm. None of the food, and none of it was cached, and none of it was up. It was just in containers on the ground. None of it was touched. Coroner quote was is that some type of animal gnawed on Bart's bones, didn't know what. Well, this buddy of mine at Natural Resources that I quote in the book said it was the strangest case that he had ever worked in 30 years. And he said that in his 30 years, Yukon grizzlies were, were known to sometimes attack humans, but would never consume them. Right. He, he couldn't understand what Bart was doing at Reed Lakes either. And that was another strange part of this. He was the optimal hunter. I mean, he knew exactly where everything was happening. And everybody said there were no moose in this area. So what was he doing there? Right. They determined he spent one night in camp before he was attacked. And the point of my story on this one is, if something can ambush and kill Bart Schleier, then all of us could be victims at any time. And the cockiness that some co some hunters have should completely be alleviated when you study this case. <laughs> it's, it's, it's chilling. It's, it's really chilling. That point you just made that he has, a, he has a, a, a super sharp hunter somehow gets ambushed by something. And he's been doing this for years. And then, yeah, we're vulnerable. So there were some articles that said, oh, there was human remains and clothing in the scat. That was a lie. And the resource officer said, I don't know how that or who said that, but it wasn't true. Okay. And that uh, there was confirmation he was attacked by a grizzly. He said that is 100% not true. And uh, he said that they went out and they contacted a lot of people that Bart work, worked with. And all of them, to a T, said that a bear would not get to Bart Schleier. They didn't believe it. It seems odd that somebody with such a skill set who's been doing this for a while would allow himself to be attacked by a bear. It does. No, it's... Uh, what the heck? And that's one of those stories that that really sticks out. There's many of those in the book, but this is one of those, you know, top 25% that really sticks out that this guy knew the woods like we know the inside of our house. Right. Fascinating. And as much as you try to analyze it away and say, well, it might have been this, might have been that, this natural resource officer said, Dave, I've never seen anything close to this in 30 years. Hmm. When did you decide to look at the subset of hunters? Well, when I had a stack of 100 cases sit on my desk <laughs> of missing people that were all hunters, I said, you know, this is a subset that probably needs to be looked at because in our discussions, we said, well, maybe there's something here we're missing that made these hikers on a trail that weren't armed an easy target. Mm. So let's let's look at hunters. Now, here's this huge stack of them sitting here. All of these people were armed, and they were outdoorsmen. So maybe there's something there we need to understand. So these are outdoorsmen, and you've got over 100 cases scattered across the country. This is 148 cases. Most of them are in the U.S., Okay. There's probably 15 or 20 in Canada, okay. a handful in Australia. And then the one outside the country, outside North America. Yeah. Okay. Very interesting. So was there any further speculation on that one case? Well, the tough part was is that the coroner, you know, usually we turn to coroners for information on the type of weapon that's used. And say, if there's a knife used in an attack then you can tell the size of the knife based on the mark it makes in the bone when it hits. Or in the same way an animal predation bites a human, a coroner can tell what type of bite mark there is by the distance there is between the bites on the bone, the size of the puncture mark or indentation on the bone, etc. In this case, they couldn't figure it out. Okay. Did you go into this? Uh, I mean, you're looking at it from... You're backtracking an investigation that's kind of already occurred. Did you feel like this was not an animal predation type of thing, which is what drew you to it because of your exclusion rule? No, because okay. the entire time, 
natural resources and RCMP classified it as a missing person. Missing person. When they went in there, they didn't find any human tracks at all. They found some wolf tracks, okay. a lot of bear tracks, and Bart's tracks. Okay, gotcha. So they had it purely as missing persons. Yeah. And, and there's, uh, there seems to be a disagreement as to what went down. I think the art, this is something that uh, we've come to this conclusion after many years of doing this, that there's a statement that was made by a New York detective a long time ago that applies here. And that's called a local report for local consumption. Mm. Now, what they mean by that is, is that the local authorities will write something up that satisfies the needs of that community, a local report or a local statement for local consumption. The idea that this small incident on the scale of the world would make it out, and we're talking about it on a radio, you know, 14 years later, sure. it's pretty amazing. So I doubt when the RCMP made that statement that, you know, we'd be following up with natural resource people, the coroner, et cetera, to confirm what they're saying is true. So a lot of times these really odd incidents, say four hunters disappear in a 10 mile radius in 18 months, something like that happens. That's not really good press for hunters coming into an area and spending money the next year. So they want to quell it. And usually they'll say something odd or they'll say something that maybe seems normal to that community. And in this case, I think it kind of sets this case that, oh, it's just a grizzly bear. It's a wild one. Don't worry about it. Nobody goes into this area anyhow, so case closed. Right. That wasn't what happened. They, they, uh, a political dismissal. Yeah. Uh, you could easily say that. Okay. What do you think happened? You know... The one thing they didn't have there that I wish they had was casted tracks of what they saw. Um, they said there were a lot of grizzly tracks in there, some wolf tracks, but they said that wolves don't attack humans, so they didn't think that was it. And they said that there were no human tracks. So if a bear attacked a human, they would go right through his pants. They would have been torn to shreds, but his, his pants were intact, which is very odd. And the amount of blood that was on the clothing that was recovered was minimal, which is also very odd. And then the last main oddity was the majority of the clothes he was wearing were never found. So where are they? That's a good point. It's not like you just take them off. No. Where, did they test the blood to determine if it was his? Yeah. Okay. Yep. I don't know. <laughs> Come on, Jay. I was hoping for answers here. <laughs> well, yeah, you're not getting any from me. I'm more stumped than... When we started the whole conversation, what? So, what do you do with that? I mean, what, what's the next phase? Do you just do you keep digging? Do you keep investigating? Well, I've got a buddy of mine that uh, owns a pretty big resort up there in the Yukon, and I've actually talked to him about this case. And I said, "Hey, I, I want to, I want you to fly me in there because he's, he's a, got a great plane." And he says, "I could get you in there." And I said, "Okay, myself and two other guys, all armed to the teeth. We want to, we want to go in there and spend a couple nights and see what happens right. because." The resource officers said that nobody goes in this area. So, you know, whatever whatever they disrupted in there didn't like it, and Bart Bart didn't make it more than one night. So, hmm. but I'll give you another case to think about here. Okay, all right, we'll, we'll, we'll leave we'll leave Bart alone. But so we're going to go to a Maine, Maine, out in your neck of the woods, right right next door. Okay, this is going to yeah. freak me out. I can tell already. Yeah, it should. So this happened November thirteenth, ninety three, in Corinth, Maine. Sure. And uh, this involved a man named Fortunato Rivera, 79 years old, raised in the Philippines, came to the U.S. when he was young, and he traveled with his son and his grandson from New Jersey to his son's hunting camp 20 miles northwest of Bangor. Okay. So he's up there. That's the Bangor is, is no no light ride from the border of New Hampshire. That's that's a ways Yeah. Up. Right. And his, fun had had, and his son had had this camp for many years. Well, his son and his grandson walked their grandpa into a hunting stand placed him in it with his gun and said, hey, it was 6 a.m. when they dropped him off, said, we'll be back at 10 a.m. They knew he would never go anywhere because he couldn't walk very well. They were going to try to drive some deer towards him, and uh, they just knew that he would be here. Grandpa would be fine. Well, at 10 a.m., they come back, and Grandpa's gone. And they searched the area, called for his name, searched for four hours, couldn't find him, and then got really upset, called the main warden service, and they were puzzled because they knew he was somewhat disabled, couldn't get around very well. Yeah. And the warden service thought this was going to be easy. And they brought in 20 people, searched all day the next day, found nothing. So the following day, searchers go up over this small mountain, down the other side, and there's this pond that's probably the size of maybe an Olympic-sized swimming pool. Okay. 
And they're looking, and they think they see something near the middle of the pond, about 20 feet from shore. And they pull it in, and it's Fortunato Rivera. And he's face up. Now, stop right there for a second. Most people don't realize this, but men and women, when they die in water, they're found in different ways. Women are found face up. Men are found face down. Less than 1% of all the cases of drowning will a man ever be found face up. And when coroners say and and do research on face-up bodies, I wrote a whole book on it. It's called Missing from One One Sobering Coincidence. Uh, Face-up bodies, usually there's a lot of mystery and a lot of intrigue, and many times they can't determine the cause of death. But anyhow, Fortunato's face-up, 20 feet from shore, they get the body in. And the resource officer stated that he had to have hiked from the stand to the pond over a rocky, treacherous stretch at least two miles uphill and then down. Now, it was November in Maine. It was described as windy and cold. Corn, the coroner confirmed that Coronado had take, or Fortunato had taken off his boots and his shirt. The cause of death was listed as heart attack, not hypothermia, not drowning. Hmm. So we are led to believe that he took off his clothing and his boots to take a swim at 10 a.m. on a cold November morning and dies when he's supposed to be in the stand waiting for his son. Is that scenario believable? No. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> that doesn't sound right at all. You, if you, As a hunter, if it's cold, and if you, even if you're uh, disabled somewhat, you're not going anywhere. You're sitting there until somebody comes to get you. Exactly. You're not walking out of that stand. No. And, uh, I mean, it's there's, there's many parts of this that don't make sense. But when you read my series of books, this plays into a large number of cases where there's a lot of similarities on this water issue. And uh, why would his boots be off? Why would his shirt come off? Why would he, at his age, you know, risk hypothermia by going into water? It's it's somewhat reminiscent of hypothermia, from what I understand, where you you think you're warm, but you're actually freezing. So you start- yeah, I get that a lot. Right. I get that a lot. And what I tell people, because I'm not saying that it's not true, right. <clears throat> but I'm somebody who looks at it in a hard way. And I say, let's think about how many people have died of hypothermia climbing the largest mountains in the world. Mm-hmm. And I've talked to a lot of these climbers that have gone to Everest, etc. And I say, can you tell me one story where you heard about a climber stripping naked on the mountain and walking around? They go, never. That's a good point. So if that is true, why isn't it happening there? That's a good point. Uh, and I had a, it was a police officer friend of mine that told me about that when so the, one of the classic cases, and I don't know if it's even classic. It's just, that he heard, I think he heard that, you know, when you go into a hypothermic state that you think you're warm. So you start de robing, but I don't ever, I don't think I've ever heard of anybody being found, uh, who died of hypothermia that was found naked. Well, there have been cases where that's been claimed. Right. And, Upon autopsy, they weren't hypothermic, and that wasn't the cause of death in okay. many of the instances. Okay. But that's how it's written up. All right. And and the interesting part about that is that there's a whole handful of cases I've written about in the past where you read the news articles and you say, oh, the person got hypothermic, stripped their clothing, and died. Well, wait a minute. It was 90 degrees that day, and it got down to 70 degrees that night on the high desert. <laughs> that's, that's, I don't think so. No. No. So you got to look at this real hard to understand what you're reading about in the news. And I would say probably 80% of the articles I've read about missing persons have factual errors in the story that when you get down into the minutia of it and you read the reports and you talk to the families, it never happened like that. Gotcha. So there's another case kind of near you. It's uh, Horicon, New York, upper New York area, Adirondack area. Uh, yeah, we've, we've had uh, a couple of shows from big Adirondack hunters uh, on this show. So we're familiar uh, with uh, the vastness of the Adirondacks. Perfect. Well, this happened uh, November 15th, 2015, not that long ago, two o'clock in the afternoon. Thomas Messick was his name, and he spent a lifetime teaching hunter safety courses. Mm-hmm. He was a veteran of the 82nd Airborne, loved hunting, went every year for decades, lived in Troy, New York. Well, on November 15th, he was wearing camo and a red and black checkered cap. So he's camo coat, camo pants. Yeah. He had a 30-30 with him, 
carried four extra rounds besides what was in the gun, and he had a walkie-talkie to talk to his friends. And he was with five companions. And they drove as far as they could on this dirt road to a place called Lily Lake. And they got out and they talked about what they were going to do. And everyone was there to help Thomas because at 82 years old and he only had one eye, uh, they wanted him to get a deer. So they marched him into this position next to a tree. They, They brought a chair with him and they said, hey, sit here. We're going to drive the deer to you. We'll be back in three hours. If we don't hear any shots or anything, we'll pick you up and take you back to the car. And they, he said, great. And uh, they went, uh, didn't see any deer. And at 2 p.m. that day, they went back. And Thomas is gone. Well, everyone scours the woods for him. And they figure out oh, we're going to find him quick. They don't find him. Don't find his rifle. Don't find anything. So they called New York DNR. 4.30, they arrive. They figure this is going to be easy. So his friends shot three rounds into the air. Nothing happened. Didn't get a response. Right. I'll stop there for a second, Jay. You would be amazed how many hunters don't understand what three shots mean. Well, if you're if you're if you're lost, the three shots means that this is where I'm at. This is an indicator. Exactly. And, and one reason why I prompt hunters to carry more rounds than just what your gun can carry, because sometimes it takes more than three rounds to hone in on where you're at. Sure. Absolutely. So uh, they don't hear anything, and they knew he could barely walk. He was dis- almost disabled, and so they, f- they figured it's going to be quick. Well, on the fifth day of the search, something really unusual happens. And from your audience's perspective, this isn't unusual. To ours, this is highly unusual. The New York State Police Special Operations Team arrives, and a team of FBI agents arrive. Okay. Now, That's strange. from the cases I've, cases I've written about, the FBI arrives at a lot of these scenes and stands back and watches and writes reports and sends them to their profiling team in Virginia, but they never get involved. Hmm. Now, why would the FBI be there when no crime has occurred? It seems like a, it's a waste of effort, why, unless there's something more to the story. You would think. You would think. Well, to, I mean, even the locals thought it was odd that these they were showing up. Hmm. Well, the, the search went on to the end of January. They found nothing. In total, 265 people searched. Multiple bloodhound teams never found a scent. Okay. They brought in six different dive teams, and they blew up all the beaver dams and searched all the creeks, rivers, and ponds in the area. They found nothing. Horicon City officials made statements that they were stunned and baffled about why Thomas wasn't found. Now, this is the second case like this in a 20-mile radius of from where this happened, and why is that important? Well, the second case, I, I won't go into it, but it's almost identical to this in that, but the other case involves an 80 year old man owned his own hunting land for 60 years, hunting with his wife in the stand, supposed to be back, never showed up, giant search just like this, never found. Gun never found, nothing ever found. Hmm. Okay. Now, the reason I bring up those cases is that sometimes people will say, oh, you know, they were in good health, so they just might have hiked out of the area. Oh, well, that didn't happen. And if, again, there was predation, that would have been a scene. Sure. Uh, and something that a, a dog would smell, I would imagine. Yeah, right. Easily. I mean, those those dogs can smell things from catch a wind. You can smell, especially a, a decomposing body. Uh, you know, it's, sometimes I find decomposed deer laying around that somebody shot that never went to look for it. You know that smell. It's instant. Well, cadaver dogs can pick up a body scent from miles away. Right, exactly. So what happened to Thomas? They have no, so they have no, they did this giant search. They can't find him. They have dogs, nothing, not a hit. Nope. And then they came back the following summer with another team, did the same thing, and also found nothing. Same area. Yep. Nothing, nothing. Nope. They kept expanding out their perimeter on their search, so the grids kept getting bigger and bigger, which is a logical way to proceed. But there comes a point when, that you have to look at the victim and say, okay, what was their ability? Did they have the ability to get get outside, say, a five-mile radius? Right. Well, yeah. Probably not him. Not this guy. No. Not not physically capable. No, I don't, I don't think anybody thought he was. Okay. So then... Now, one of the most... We could go on to a, a, a real recent case if you want to. Okay. All right. Let, yeah. Let's check out a recent case. So these, these are bizarre cases. And th- when you're doing your research... Do you find are you, do you bump into situations like you did in the first case where you're asking for for information you're you're exercising your freedom of information act and not getting the information that you need? 
What happens occasionally, okay. and I think I think what happens is that law enforcement, when you've got a case where you found nothing, that they don't like people looking over their shoulder or second guessing what they've done, or maybe. You know, let's say you and I and a hundred other people go into the woods and we find Thomas. Well, it may sound good, but in reality, it may look may make somebody look bad. Right. It looks makes them look like the professionals that they were uh, supposed to be do not have the right. skill set for which the taxpayers were paying them for. Right. Yeah, but you know. I, I, I've talked in front of the largest group of search and rescue people in the world. It's called NASAR. Okay. And one of the things I've said to them is I said, whatever I write, this is never an indictment of you. Okay. And the reason being is that if the dogs can't find the scent, how do I expect you to find the body? The wilderness is vast. Yes, it is. And, you know, if some, let's say it's, it's raining. In many of these cases that I write about, it is raining or it's snowing. You're going to, you're going to probably huddle up in some kind of sheltered area, get in between mm-hmm. some boulders, maybe even find a, some tree root area. And you're going to huddle up in there until it clear. It's clear. Right. And if you die in there, the chances of us finding you, you know, infinitesimal. Right. So I, I, I said, Hey, this, this isn't an indictment of you. And, and too many times, the bodies are found in an area that was previously searched. There's one case I write about where they were looking for an eight-year-old boy in the Sierra Nevada mountains of California for two weeks. Mm. This, is, this is weird. And uh, every day, there were 200 searchers that took a trail up over the top of this mountain into this area where this boy was last seen. And on the second week, searchers get up at 6 a.m. and they start going out on the trail. And here's this tree, a huge Douglas fir that fell across the trail. And the boy's body is laying on top of the tree dead. What? Yes, that was a true story. And uh, they said he died of hypothermia. And one thing I couldn't get out of the coroner's office is how long the boy had been dead. Right. So there's a lot of weird stuff that happens. And what I, when I tell, get into conferences and I'm talking in front of groups and things, I said, there's a lot of hunters out there that I've met over the years that have read my books and said, you know, I don't know who to tell this to, but something really strange happened to me in the woods. <laughs> and hunters right. are a quiet group. And they don't want to be looked at as their peers as being idiots or fools or whatever. But I was told this, uh, get off topic here for a second, but sure. I live in Colorado and there's a lot of hunting for uh, elk yep. that happens above 10,000 feet. And this guy was hunting at about 11.5 and there was high grass up, up between knee and hip length. And he says, I'm walking along and I hear this strange sound coming from just out of sight over the over a knoll through the grass and uh he says i i kept looking and i kept walk, getting closer he said it almost sounded like a herd of elk coming towards me and he goes i, I kind of pick my rifle rifle up and i'm slowly walking towards it and he said maybe 50 60 feet away all the grass is going down as though it's getting trampled by something large but you can't see it and it passes me and it keeps going <laughs> said it was the oddest thing he's ever seen. And he said the nothing was distorted and there was no wind, but that was it. Yeah. And that and we've seen things that and I've seen things that I thought was very strange in the woods, things like sat on a deer stand for an hour watching a swamp and hoping something big would come by and I'm watching and I'm watching all of a sudden this giant tree falls over in the middle of the swamp and a deer jumps up because the the, the tree fell and runs by me. Just a, a standard tree, totally straight up in the air in the middle of a swamp. What the heck? How, do, how does a tree that is totally fine for an hour decides to fall over and almost falls on the deer? Very strange. <laughs> Very strange stuff. I can't explain that. You know, uh, through a, a matter of connections, several years ago, I met uh, Les Stroud, Survivor Man. Okay. And uh, Les and I got to be really good friends. And... Two years ago, my son, who's a film major, said, Dad, you know, we ought to do something. We ought to make a movie about some of your cases. Yeah. And uh, make a long story short, we went to crowd, crowdfunding and got everything we needed, made a full-length documentary film, released it six months ago. It's called Missing 411. You can watch it on Amazon yeah. and on iTunes. But Les is in the movie. Okay. And we used him to show the impossibility of some of these trips that kids have made. 
And one of them was a a two-year-old boy disappeared from this rural ranch in Oregon. And they find him nine hours later, 12 miles away over two mountain ranges, and he's face down in the snow, barely alive. Hmm. So what we did was, is we started at four o'clock in the afternoon with Les, and we knew the track the kid would have had to have taken. And we wanted to see if Les could make that same amount of mileage in that amount of time without killing himself. And about halfway through, he said, Dave, there's no way. He says, we know the topography here. We have a map. He said, I'd kill myself walking through here in the dark. And he said, I don't believe a two-year-old could cover that amount of mileage in that amount of time. Yeah, well, uh, two-year-olds can't walk that far. I I would imagine they'd just stop, to be honest. (laughs) Yeah. Do you have kids, Jay? I do. I have a 13-year-old and a a 10-year-old boy. Yeah, well, at the time, uh, my son was 22, and he said, Dad, I don't think I could have done that at two years old. No. I don't think any two-year-old could do that. No. Two-year-olds, they'll run through the backyard and kind of wander a little bit, but that's about it. Then they come back. Well, again, there's there's several. In fact, there's probably over 40 of those stories that I lay out about small children that have covered phenomenal distances and gone to phenomenal heights. Rather than going downhill if they're missing, they're climbing uphill. It doesn't make any sense. That is bizarre. So uh, this most <laughs> recent case. Okay. We get off on a tangent. All right. Back to the recent case. Yeah. So this happened uh, along the southern Oregon coast between a place called Gold Beach and Grants Pass. And this area is really remote, really steep. Uh, It's tough hunting because there's, there aren't many meadows. You're hunting in between trees, but there's a lot of wildlife there. Um, Okay. A guy named Sean Higgins, 41, and his son, Trevor, 21, and uh, Sean's brother, or Trevor's uncle, went into this area to go hunting. And uh, it was October 14th, 2016. Uh, Trevor, the 21-year-old, had killed a buck the previous day, and now they were working to get his dad and his uncle one. Mm. Well, they went out, and uh, they were supposed to meet back at the car at 2.30. Sean never arrived, and Trevor and the uncle said, okay, we'll split up, and we'll go out, and we'll yell for my dad, and we'll see if we can find him. Well, they split up, couldn't find him, and Trevor now didn't come back to the car. So now you've got two people missing. So the uncle left, got assistance, that night, and that night, freezing rain and lightning started. Okay. This went on for five days, and searchers from all over Oregon were helping because they knew the family. Yeah. Well, five days into it, they find Trevor on this mountainside alive, uh, hypothermic. Helicopters take him to the hospital. He lives. He's fine. But hundreds of searchers kept going with helicopters and canines trying to locate Sean, the dad. Okay. Well, they interviewed uh, Sean's wife, Trevor's mom, and she said, I don't care who you thought my husband was, but he is the last person in the world that's going to disappear in that area you're looking. Because he's hunted that area since he was 18, and he could draw you every nook and cranny within 10-mile radius of where he disappeared. He did not disappear. So the implication was that, oh, you know, maybe some marijuana growers got him or something. But everything within 15 miles was combed, and there were no gardens found. There was nothing found. And, you know, we've gone through another summer where they searched high and low everywhere for Sean, and they they can't find him. And, uh, you know, they interviewed his son, and he was just completely heartbroken that he couldn't help find his dad. His brother couldn't find his dad. But the weird thing was, in this instance, is that this is probably a one percenter, whereas one percent of the time, in any instance, two people disappear. Right. If they could find Trevor because they were combing so efficiently, they should have been able to find Sean. Right. Excellent point. And because they went back in the summer with cadaver dogs, they still couldn't find a body. So where did Sean go? But you see, I know people are or at home thinking, oh, you know, this, this stuff just, just happens. But if you knew the number of times this happens, right. and you knew the conscientious nature and the comprehensive nature of these searches, you'd understand why this doesn't make sense. Right. Fascinating stuff. Where do you find yourself trying to draw conclusions here when you look at as many cases as, as you've looked at? Realize the numbers that you've realized. Wait a minute, this isn't, this isn't just haphazard. This isn't just onesie twosies. This is a significant number with very odd circumstances. Where does your mind go? Well, one of the things that happens, 
uh, it's happened a lot in the last several years just because of the notoriety I have in the search world is that I get uh, victims' families calling for me okay. and asking me for an opinion on what to do next and how to proceed. And one thing I never do is I never interject myself in the search. I mean, 90% of all searching is done by volunteers. It's yeah. not done by professionals. These are volunteers who get certifications in search and rescue. They're people just like you and me who sure. spend their weekend times looking for people. God bless them. I mean, they're doing God's work. Mm -hmm. But uh, I'll never interject myself. Now, after they're all done, I'll, I'll sit down and go over maps with them and say, well, Based on the odds of what I know, where people are found, this is probably the most highest percentage area to look, and we'll go back and look. Or, or I'll help them try to understand that they aren't the only ones out there that have gone through this. Mm -hmm. I have several families that have volunteered to talk to other families that have been victimized like this. And, you know, there's a lot of hunters every year that get killed in the woods and shot by other hunters. Sure. And that's that's horrific, but there's nothing worse in my mind than you losing a loved one and having that open-ended nature of it, not knowing what happened. Right. There's no closure. You don't know. That's tough. That's tough. That's really tough. A loved one that, I mean, it's it's bad enough with just a pet. It just disappears. You never see again. Never mind a mom or a dad or a kid. No, there's a, there's a couple families I know of where they lost a son and that dad went back every week or every weekend looking for his son for months and months because he couldn't rectify it in his mind that, you know, this isn't your fault. It's okay to stop looking. He's not alive. But he, that mater, that fraternal bond that you have or that maternal bond that you may have, that's a strong one that, you know, will keep you at, at that doorstep for years. Yeah. Every day you'd be, you'd be trying something to rectify the situation because it'll never be fixed. No. That's mind-blowing. Now, the last story I have in the book, I'm not going to give you a lot of specifics about it, but I'll give you the general feeling of what happened, because this is the one in the book that really opened it up for me getting tons of emails from people, hunters, okay. who would tell me things that they probably would never even tell their best friend. But I have a friend of mine that's a physicist that I've gone to on many occasions to get answers to science-related topics. Sure. He's a genius, and he's one of the most credible men in the world that I know. And uh, he's he's been used by a lot of organizations in the past. Well, he didn't even tell me this. It came in secondhand that his wife, who I knew was a bow hunter, was in a deer blind hunting like four or five miles from their house. Okay. She's been hunting for years. Tough, nice lady. And something weird happened to her in the in the blind. Hmm. And so I, I called him up, and they said, yeah. We don't, we don't talk much about it, but here's what happened. So she goes into the blind, and she's probably 25 or 30 feet looking into this area. They live in Ohio, mm -hmm. looking into this area of trees. And there's a small clearing in front of her, and she's, she's texting a friend of hers with her phone. And she looks up, and she says that she opened and closed her eyes like four or five times because she thought maybe she was she had a tear or something in her eye because it, it didn't seem right what she was looking at. Yeah. And there was like visual distortion in the tree across from her. And she has this phone in her hand and she thought she took a photo. And this this distortion in the tree moves from tree to tree. Hmm. And now she's getting really scared. So she's holding her her phone in one end, her bow in the other, and she's going, "Dave, I don't know what I I don't know what this is, but this it's not anything normal I've ever seen. And then eventually it moves to another tree and it's out of sight. Hmm. She waits 45 minutes when it's gone and she gets back to her house. Just as she steps in the door, some neighbors are visiting. And so she doesn't feel comfortable telling her husband about what happened. Yeah. But about 35 minutes later, their phone rings and it's their nephew. And he's in band practice two miles from where she was in her hunting blind. And they were on the band field practicing. He's telling his uncle, he goes, uncle, did you see in the sky tonight what was going on? And he goes, what do you mean? He goes, there were three super bright lights in the sky that hovered over us while we were doing band practice and watched us for like a long, long time. And then all of a sudden they went straight up into the sky and were gone. And uh, he goes, wow. And so he says, no, I haven't heard of that, blah, blah, blah. So the friends leave, he gets off the phone and his wife says, uh, I need to tell you what happened. And she explains to him, 
that while this apparently was going on at their band practice at the same time, two miles away, she sees this thing moving between trees. Hmm. And my buddy goes, wait a minute. And he goes and he gets a DVD and he puts on the movie Predator and he shows this distortion scene in the trees and says, did it look something like that? (laughs) And she said, figure wise, no, but distortion wise, that's exactly what I saw. (laughs) Wow. (laughs) Now, so this guy is an optical physicist. He's the best in the world. Yep. He takes the phone, he downloads the picture, and 90% of the picture is kind of blurred, but I've got some in the book that nobody's seen, and it almost looks like a DNA strand in part of the picture. Hmm. Well, he calls Verizon Technical Services because he knows all the guys there. He sends them the picture, and they said, well, that's, that's really interesting because that phone took that picture But based on the technical aspects of the phone, it was impossible for it to take that picture Hmm. because of the amount of pixels, the size, and the technical attributes of the photo that was impossible for them to do. What does that mean? (laughs) That's what he said. He said, (laughs) it's like they were talking, double talk. He says, okay, so confirm the photo. He says, I know the photo came from the camera. I downloaded it. But he said, confirm you're saying that came from that camera. Oh, yeah. But you're saying that that camera couldn't take the picture. That's correct. (laughs) Now, the reason that was in the book is because there were several points there. First of all, it came, in my mind, from the most reputable man in the world. He did a big investigation on it, wrote a big technical paper about it because of what Verizon said. Right. And it involved a hunter and involved a super unusual thing she saw in the woods, coupled with an aerial anomaly at the same time. I said, I've got to put that in. Plus pictures she took that really never showed anything of of value other than some oddities. Now, when other hunters have written that, uh, read that, I got about three emails after the book first came out from people who said they saw very similar things. Really? Yeah. (laughs) And and the the thing was is that it was one woman and two guys, and they said, "Hey, please don't." don't use this anywhere, but just use it for your own edification that this is going on everywhere. So there's nothing to gain by these people coming forward and saying these things. Right. Right. Cause nobody wants to say who they are. Right. I don't know if I would want to say if I saw something, I mean the, the tree falling over about as far as I would get, but after that, I think I'm going anonymous. Well, I don't know if I saw something like that in the woods, if I'd ever go back to the woods without a gun, a big, huge gun, but I don't even think that'd do any good. Right. Well, th- th- this is this is my my perplexion or my. Th- here's the problem that that I'm I'm in, in facing here. We promote hunting all the time, and I think I just we just scared the bejesus out of hunters wanting to ever go back in the woods. Well, <laughs> interesting paradigm. You know, I believe every story I write about, I can guarantee it's true, and I, I've I've done the legwork on it, but. And the guys I hunt with are some of the guys that are also doing the investigations with me. And the one behavior that we've changed is we don't leave sight of each other anymore. Mm. We always keep each other in sight yeah. somehow. And that, that's a key point. And it doesn't matter if we're talking about hikers or we're talking about hunters. There's a lot of these stories at just the point the hunter is out of sight or out of frame from their friends. Something happens and they're gone. Right. And uh, that's pretty scary. Doesn't make sense. <laughs> no, it doesn't, doesn't make, make sense, sense to the family either. Right. There's nothing that would make sense of any of that. Wow. So how many how many stories do you have in the book? There's 148 stories. Okay. All right. And you've shared. And they're all you know. There's there's all an offshoot. There's there's no easy explanations. That's why they're in the book. I mean, right. I probably vetted 800 missing hunter stories to get to that 148. Okay. And you've shared five of them with us, but we've got several more. If we wanted to read more, we've got a, several more to read, which is intriguing yet scary. Well, the way the way you and I kind of met each other is uh, through uh, Cuz Strickland over Cus- at Mossy Oak. That's right. And uh, Cuz and I have been friends for a long time, and I did a show with him about this where we went hunting. And uh, the crew there... <laughs> As soon as the cameras went off, they were asking all these questions, just like you and I are talking right now, because these guys are in the woods all the time. Right. And you start to think about, and this is the same thing that uh, that uh, Les Stroud and I have talked about a lot. And he goes, you know, Dave, in my years in the woods, there's a lot of things that happen, and I don't even want to think about it. I just kind of put it in the back of my mind, and I block it. But there were a couple of nights where we sat up and talked late at night, and he goes, oh, there's, there's a lot, been a lot of things that have happened to me that, you know— unexplainable. And one of them 
several of them are these giant trees that fall in close proximity of you. Right. And that's not normal. Right. Especially when they're all the other trees around them that are identical are still standing straight up. Right. It doesn't make a whole lot of sense. You know, there's one other thing I want to go over with you, Jay, and that's just some basic safety things that every hunter should think about before they leave their house. Okay. First of all, you got to tell somebody that loves you and you trust where exactly you're going and when exactly you're going to be out. Yep. This is super important. Seems real basic, but that's imperative. Then before you walk out that door, you check the weather, the long range weather for where you're going in the field. Yep. And if it says it's going to snow, you think twice about going. Heavy rain, lightning, those kind of things, think twice about it and go another day. Okay. And then uh, even if the area you're in doesn't have cell phone coverage, take your cell phone with you anyhow and keep it charged. There's new technology out there where they can pick up text messages and cell phones, even though there's not a tower in the area at the time. And then uh, personally, every time I go out in the woods doing anything, I carry a satellite phone. Mm. And the satellite phone I carry also has an emergency transponder button in it, personal locator beacon. So I carry not only the personal locator beacon, but the sat phone that also has a beacon built into it. Gotcha. And I, I know those sat phones are expensive. It cost me like $50 a month for two minutes of service, but that two minutes can save your life. Right, right. Um, always carry a hard copy of your map for the region you're in. Mm-hmm. I also carry a GPS trail guide with extra batteries. Uh, several years ago, I found, uh, I was in a backpacking store, and they were selling this emergency blanket that's about the size of your fist that probably weighs a half a pound. Mm. And one time we were out, we just thought, oh, for the heck of it, let's open this thing up. And my God, for like six bucks, everybody should be carrying that thing. It's bright orange, keeps you warm in an emergency. It's really light, should have it. And then uh, for the hunters, if I tell my, there's more bow hunters that disappear per capita than regular firearm hunters. Okay. If you're going bow hunting, carry a large caliber pistol with you as well. Yeah. Um, and when you're hunting, always carry extra ammunition, namely about nine extra rounds. And I know it may be heavy, but always carry that for that three round burst that we were talking about earlier. Correct. And then when you're hunting with partners, this is, this is really important. Your partner is your lifeline. Yep. Make sure they're healthy. Make sure they're in shape. Make sure you trust them. Make sure they're not a drunk because if your butt is on the line, that person is going to save your life. Right. And there's so many stories I've written about and talked to people about where their partners saved their life. And if they weren't in optimum condition, it never would have happened. Yep. You're absolutely Extra right. Extra water right. and energy bars always. And I would say that's, that's the main part of it right okay. there. What about a compass? You know, compass is always good. Absolutely. That's another reason why I tell you to carry your phone. Most phones have a compass in it. Right. I'm always afraid that sure. my, my phone might die, so I don't have access to that compass. So I need the old, old school one, the fundamental ones. Yeah. Exactly. No, for sure. Right. But here's you'd be surprised how many people don't know how to use a compass. That's true. Growing up in New Hampshire, you kind of have to know how to use the compass. Oh yeah. You know. But here, here's here's even a, another twist. Compasses, for whatever reason, sometimes lose their magnetism to the point where they're reversed. I picked up my trusty old one the other day just to check it. It's pointing south, not north. Talk. Mm. About, what would happen if you were in the middle of the woods? <laughs> Your trusty little compass points you in exactly the opposite direction. I've had this happen more than once. I don't know what causes it. I don't know why. But this was a decent compass. And it now points due south, not due north. That's bizarre. Oh, we'd either find you in Ontario or Mexico, huh? <laughs> exactly. That could be a life or death situation. You yeah, get close to sure. the nearest road and you head the opposite way into the deepest vastness of the wilderness in a snowstorm that sneaks up on you. And uh, you're gone forever. Well, you know, the guys out there and the ladies out there that are hunting, I tell them, if you ever want to get a hold of me, my email's on our website. Okay. And the uh, website is Can-Am, like Canadian-American, canammissing.com. Yep. Yep. And uh, I'm always, always reading stories that people give me, odd things. And uh, trust me, I probably heard just about everything in the world. Nothing would surprise me. Nothing would surprise me. And uh, I'm always interested in hearing from them. Excellent. And if we want to grab a copy of the book on the website too? Yes, sir, it is. Okay. All right. Fascinating. Do you have ambitions to write a second volume two of the Missing Hunters? Uh, you know, 
I say that this research is like spokes in a wheel, and I'm looking for that next spoke. Okay. And if I suppose if there was a big rash of hunters that went missing that I found out about, I'd probably document it. I'm not sure if I'd spend another more time writing another book about hunters because I'm not sure if we'd learn more from that. But every time I write a book, I learn something from it. And so that bit of knowledge is important. Gotcha. So there's other aspects to the missing persons subculture or or sub sub data set that you're looking at. And Oh, there's a, there's a series of water related disappearances where young men going to school, college disappeared. And there's, there's so much more to that story. And I wrote this book called missing 411, a sobering coincidence. It has to do with mainly Wisconsin, Chicago, New York, college towns where kids were found in rivers and lakes. And I wrote a book about that and the related factors to those disappearances match exactly with what I've written about in other books, meaning canines can't track them point to point. There's weather changes, there's clustering, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. Gotcha. Wow. Well, Dave, this has been fascinating. The time's already gone by for the most part. Um, and we've got all the information on how to get your book and it's been an honor and a pleasure to have you on the show. And these stories are fascinating. I can't wait to get a copy of your book now. Well, Jay, you know, next time you're out hunting, you're sitting around the campfire, read a few chapters. <laughs> <laughs> Appreciate that, Dave. Well, thanks to Dave Pilates for joining us for the last hour and telling us some very interesting stories about hunters that go missing. It's kind of freaky, to be quite honest. If you'd like to pick up a copy of his book, he did mention it, but it's Missing 411 Hunters, Unexplained Disappearances. You can find it at Can Am. That's C-A-N as in Nancy, A-M as in Mary, missing.com. And you'll find all the books he's written, including this one about the hunters. He's got a new book that just came off the press called Missing 411 Off the Grid, which explores more of those people that are just kind of have gone out in the wilderness and uh, never came back. So hopefully this doesn't freak you out too much. I'm looking at a copy of Dave's book right here in the studio as I record this. And I would like to mention, thank you to Dave, for mentioning those safety items at the end there. But it's uh, those are all things that we as hunters, especially if we if we travel vastly into the wilderness to ho- go hunt our favorite species, those are some great points. And as, I, as you saw, I, I added in compass. But always check to make sure your compass is pointing in the right direction before you head into the field. Sometimes those things get reversed. I don't know why, but they do. Just looking at his book, especially at the end, he's got some stats, uh, and there's, on page 320, there's a list of all of the hunters that went missing as part of this book. And there's one, two, three, four pages, almost five pages, and chronologically ordered, dating back to 1890, all the way up through 2016. He also breaks out some statistics, and most disappearances by year was 1950, where there were eight disappearances by month, vast majority in October and November. Then he breaks it down into some anomalies like certain bow hunters, geographical and date clusters, ages. So there's some interesting data at the end of this book that I think is fascinating along with the stories. And if you look on the back of the book, there's a big cluster map and you'll start to see where the majority of these folks are disappearing. Again, canammissing.com. You can find all his books, including the ones about the hunters. Dusty, do we have a Chubby Tines Tip of the Week this week? Yeah, we do, Jay. And uh... The Chubby Tines Tip of the Week is sponsored by Morse's Sporting Goods. Firearms, use firearms, bows, use bows. Located at 85 Kentucky Falls Road in Hillsborough, New Hampshire. Give Jim a call at 603-464-3444, morse'ssportinggoods.com. Your dollars go further in New Hampshire. There's no sales tax. Morse's Sporting Goods. Something that uh, actually popped in my mind this evening as I was walking into a, a new unknown piece of property. And, uh, you know, I, I was I pulled in, parked my truck, and, and I literally made probably 25 steps in the woods. Hmm. And next thing you know, I was blowing deer out. No kidding. And I said, oh, man, this, this, this is good and bad. Real good that the deer are bedding there. Real bad for me wanting to hunt right in that spot. Right. Right. So, you know, it, it, it comes down to when I, when I went in there and blew them deer out that quick that I know that I need to, to capitalize on that spot, but be extremely careful getting in and out of there. Um, mm. and, and literally, I'm, I'm 50 yards in the woods. I set up a ground blind, and I'm going to hunt right adjacent to where I know they're bedding at. But I took a leaf blower with me, 
and I blew the leaves off the ground so that when I walk in and out of there, I'm quiet. I think there's a, there's enough cover between me and and where they're bedding at to comfortably slide in there with the with, with the leaf blower blowing the leaves out. I got a quiet trail to walk on to bare dirt. It's it's absolutely ironic that you say that, and here's why. I picked up a new leaf blower this year. I had one that was just a basic handheld unit, and I could never figure out why the leaves wouldn't pile up when I was actually blowing leaves around the way they I see everybody else. seemed like they'd zip through the yard, no problem. Well, I think it's because I didn't have the power that I needed, so I decided to go out and get one of those backpack blowers and picks, uh, blows leaves around like nobody's business. So I got to thinking, like, you know what? I'm going to – it's awful crunchy on the way to my tree stand right now, real right. crunchy. I'm taking this leaf blower out tomorrow at noon. And I'm going to blow all the way through to my tree stand just so I can get in and out of there quietly. Because, man, no wonder the deer aren't coming in. They can hear me from a mile around. It's amazing. Yep. Absolutely great. Great idea. Yeah, so take your leaf blower out there and, and blow your walking trail out and clean it up so that you're quiet, leaving, and coming and going. That's crazy that I did that or will be doing that tomorrow. And I had the exact thought today. We are on the same page, my friend. Perfect. Dusty, where can we find you when you're not hanging out here in the studios with me? Uh, shoot me an email, dusty at bigbuckregistry.com. You can look me up on Instagram and Twitter at Chasing Antler, facebook.com forward slash chubby tines outdoors. Jay, where can the people reach out to you when you're not on the mic? Likewise, you can shoot me an email, jay at bigbuckregistry.com, and you can visit us on Facebook, facebook.com forward slash bigbuckregistry. We're also on Twitter, which is twitter.com forward slash bigbuckregistry. We are also on Instagram, instagram.com forward slash bigbuckregistry, and YouTube, which is youtube.com forward slash bigbuckregistry. On YouTube, you can listen to all of our podcasts in their entirety. As far as videos are concerned, it's a boring video, but the audio content is there, so you can actually listen to our podcast. You can also listen to all of our live shows that we've done on Thursday nights when we do do them, and we've gone back and interviewed, re-interviewed a lot of our previous guests we had on the show just to put a face to a voice. Let's put it that way. You can always listen to our show on other places as well, not just YouTube. We're found on iTunes, iHeartRadio, TuneIn Radio, Stitcher, and Blueberry. And if you would like to submit a buck to our page for consideration and be featured on our page in front of 250,000 diehard deer hunting fans, all you have to do is go to bigbuckregistry.com forward slash my buck and all of the instructions will be right there. I think that's pretty much everywhere we're at. I think that's a wrap, Dusty. That's a whole lot of big buck, Jay. Sure is. I'm Jay Scott. I'm Dusty Phillips. And this is the Big Buck Registry's Deer Hunting Podcast. We'll see you next week. Can't wait.